say this much for Ready Player One a little while back, as much as I found a lot of the Remember This nerdstalgia reference humor to be coming from a fairly conventional playlist, I have been surprised to note how much of Generation Z was apparently hearing about certain gags for the very first time. One of the apparent head-scratchers, though, did not exactly shock me. Namely, the formal costume wear name drop of Buckaroo Banzai, a cult classic the longevity of which is surprising even to its fans, of which I am most definitely one. <laughs> Fully titled The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension, the 1984 sci-fi action comedy was a one-of-a-kind oddity ostensibly satirizing serialized pulp adventure fiction of yesteryear aimed at young men and boys, specifically Doc Savage, but also stuff like Tom Swift, The Destroyer, that kind of thing, but it's also in a sense a kind of long-form deadpan anti-comedy routine, like an especially out-there Andy Kaufman character bit stretched out to a feature film, telling a single joke over and over with a straight face, waiting for each member of the audience to eventually key in on the punchline and understand that they were supposed to have started laughing a while ago. Confused? Just imagine what it was like when they first put this thing in theaters. I put down the phone. Operator, I want to make a call to Mr. John Big Booty at a Yoyodyne Propulsions Systems. I'm just, just hold my hat. It flies like a truck. Good. What is a truck? Thing is, unlike similar We're Kidding or Are We cinematic acts of mischief like Streets of Fire or Big Trouble in Little China, which, yes, shares a connection in writer-director W.D. Richter, which we'll get back to, Buckaroo Banzai's joke was not only almost imperceptibly obscure in its own day, today I honestly have to wonder if it's even discernible as a joke at all. To explain, well, we're gonna need to talk plot, so if you haven't seen the movie, you might want to go correct that. There's a terrific Blu-ray out there from Shout Factory, and it's not hard to find otherwise, because here comes your spoiler warning. Okay, so here, as concisely but so the discussion makes sense as possible, is the basic storyline of the film. <clears throat> Peter Weller stars as Buckaroo Banzai, a half-American, half-Japanese master neurosurgeon, particle physicist, race car driver, paramilitary operative, spy, secret agent, world traveler, and lead musician of the popular rock and roll band the Hong Kong Cavaliers, whose membership includes an assortment of other multi-talented musician, genius, super soldiers, etc., who travel the world righting wrongs, conducting super science experiments for the benefit of mankind, and battling the forces of evil. Evil! In addition to those allies, Banzai maintains allegiances with the U.S. and other world governments, is globally famous through licensing his name and adventures through comic books and merchandise, and is assisted the world over by independent operative groups including the Radar Rangers, Ham Radio Monitors, and Blue Blazer Irregulars Assault Teams. As the film opens, Buckaroo's test of an interdimensional rift-inducing laser device, the Overthruster, allows his jet car to pass through a mountain by crossing into the Eighth Dimension, a breakthrough that reawakens the madness of an old enemy in John Lithgow's Dr. Lizardo, a madman who originally invented the Overthruster but was thought to have been driven insane by the the experience. He did not go through the walls! Holy Torito! In reality, Lazardo's mind has been inhabited by that of Lord John Warfin, the leader of the Red Lectroids, a hostile race of aliens, the majority of whom were imprisoned in the Eighth Dimension generations ago by their enemies, the Black Lectroids. A small number of Red Lectroids apparently escaped to Earth in 1938, but their attempted invasion was covered up by the supposed Orson Welles War of the World's Radio hoax, but now that the Overthruster has been perfected by Banzai, they are scheming to steal it back and free their brethren to restart the campaign of intergalactic domination, a scenario which an emissary of the Black Lectroids is dispatched to give Team Banzai one chance to thwart, or they'll solve the problem themselves by tricking the United States and Soviet Union into a thermonuclear war in order to destroy the Earth and the Red Electroids with it, just to be on the safe side. That's an action that the Kremlin will most certainly misinterpret as an American first strike. They're already a little trigger happy as it is. Stop! John Wolfen before sun. The situation is further complicated by the revelation that the Red Lectroids have earned the protection of shady government officials by pretending to be weapons developers working on a top-secret aircraft, and the sudden appearance of Ellen Barkin as Penny Pretty, a mystery woman revealed to be the previously unknown twin sister of Buckaroo's late wife, who was assassinated in a previous adventure by his arch-nemesis, not Dr. Lazardo, a different guy, and also Jeff Goldblum is here. Congratulations! You drove through a mountain. I did. You drove right through a mountain the other day. You did it right after you left him with the operation. You hadn't even said anything about it. Didn't even mention you were in His name is New Jersey. He's a surgeon, and he wears a cowboy costume. Yeah. Okay, so obviously the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the Eighth Dimension's first joke, which succeeds rather admirably, is to faithfully recreate the experience of reading serialized paperback adventure stories like the Doc Savage books in the way most readers who became fans of them would most often first come to them, picking up a book that seemed interesting only to realize you were coming in around volume number 27 of God knows how many other, and in the long era of human history before Wikipedia, keep in mind, having to just find your way through all the backstory, extra characters, callbacks, continuity, world-building, and tangential references, and you could only presume had been introduced and explained 
at some point in one of the earlier stories. The whole thing is played completely straight-faced. In fact, apart from Lithgow's barn burner of an over-the-top performance as Dr. Lazardo, sealed with a curse as sharp as a knife. Doomed is your soul and damned is your life. Buzz off. Big booty. More power to him. Big booty. <laughs> I'm out of my missing circuit! No! Buckaroo Banzai is essentially deadpan delivery the movie, hence the inspired casting of Peter Weller, who's sort of like the bizarro world Nicolas Cage, in that he's memorable precisely because of his natural stone-faced stoicism. If you want an actor who always appears so present, he's practically part of the scenery, but still technically acting and doing a fine job of it, Weller is your guy. Even Goldblum, occasionally serving as a sort of audience POV character, is only ever surprised by things that would be considered unusual to someone in the universe where everything else about Buckaroo Banzai already makes sense. If you're still having difficulty picturing a reference point, think the first men in black, but everyone is Tommy Lee Jones. Also, that's still only part of the gag. It's the follow-up that makes Buckaroo Banzai truly inspired, but also what makes me curious as to whether or not reality has actually cancelled out the punchline. See, Buckaroo Banzai does not actually exist as a franchise or even a thing outside this one movie. Buckaroo, President's on line one, calling about is everything okay with the alien space cloud from Planet 10, or should he just go ahead and destroy Russia? Tell him yes on one and no on two. Which was yes, destroy Russia or uh, number two? Okay, after the movie there was a novelization and there's been some toys and tie-ins and several failed attempts to launch sequels and TV shows, but everything else, all the backstories and the allusions to other adventures, the random details about where different characters and pieces of equipment come from, what people were doing before, during, and after this adventure, the deep lore deleted scenes explaining the existence of Hanoi Zhan, the Fu Manchu and or Mandarin-esque arch nemesis who killed Penny's twin and Buckaroo's wife, all that world building that feels exactly like it's drawing from an actual backlog of material to make all the devoted Buckaroo Banzai super fans and the audience geek out when the rug suckers make a cameo appearance or gasp on realizing who Penny Pretty looks like, it's all a well-crafted fake. Mostly drawn from dozens of unfinished bonsai script ideas screenwriter Earl M. Rock had half-completed and warehoused over the years while working on other projects, and hammered into an expertly realized facsimile of honest-to-god fan service, with the ultimate joke of the whole thing not simply being, remember reading awesome weird books and comics and having to start in the middle like this, but also, look how ridiculous this kind of storytelling feels when you do it in a movie. Emilio Lazardo. Yeah. Well, last night he kills a guard and breaks out of the Trenton home for the criminally insane. Ten minutes later he cops a Maserati Bora, totaled it a block away. Holy moly. Maserati Bora. Mm-hmm. Coded. Calling all blue blaze irregulars in the Garden State. Buckaroo and Shoffman. One repeat coordinates. Dad! Dad! Buckaroo's in trouble! Say what? Halloween 1938, a uh, War of the Worlds, that fake radio news broadcast that got everybody scared thinking real live Martians were landing in Grover's Mill, New Jersey. However, they didn't come here on a non-stop flight. They blasted through the eighth dimension in 1938 over in Grover's Mill. Where there was a huge electrical dimensional accident some giant explosion, and they hypnotized Orson Welles into covering it up. So first he says, there's an invasion from Mars, but then he says, no, 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 it's just a radio show hoax. Get it? Oh, let's go. Orson Welles. What about Yo-Yo Dine? What about Dr. Lazardo? Again, neither the film nor anyone in it ever breaks character. So about 80 to 90% of the comedy in this action comedy ends up being drawn from the notion that seeing actual human beings act out convoluted, pulpy, comic book style, callback laden, serialized melodrama completely straight will be impossible to take seriously on its face. And well, fast forward, give or take 28 years. I'm sorry, making... Nick. What were you lying? I'd like to know why S.H.I.E.L.D. is using the Tesseract to build weapons of mass destruction. Because of him. Me. Last year, Earth had a visitor from another planet who had a grudge match that leveled a small town. The world's filling up with people who can't be matched. They can't be controlled. Like you controlled the cube? Your work with the Tesseract is what drew Loki to it, and his allies. It is a signal to all the realms that the Earth is ready for a higher form of war. A higher form? You forced our hand. 1984's absurdist self-parody is 2012 and onwards globally dominant popular culture reshaping mega franchise. Throwaway sight gag back then. Why is there a water gun there? I'll tell you later. Important sequence necessarily addressing an actual plot inconsistency today. Odin's treasures. Fake. That's the stuff. 
offered here is fake. Weak. Smaller than I thought it would be. That's not bad. How about that? On the one hand, it certainly adds an extra level of absurdity to the proceedings. On the other hand, I can't really begin to imagine how Buckaroo Banzai's overriding meta-joke plays if you can't actually recall a world where a random sci-fi action comedy assuming a good chunk of its audience has done the homework. Oh no. Yeah, and this dude sounds like a badass, man. Like he comes up to him and says, yo, I'm looking for this dude who's new on scene, who's like flashing this fresh tack, who's got like bomb moves, right? Who you got? She's like, well, we got everything nowadays. We got a guy who jumps, we got a guy who swings, we got a guy who crawls up the walls, you gotta be more specific. And he's like, I'm looking for a guy that shrinks. And I'm like, this isn't a perfectly normal occurrence. The good news is, even if the film's big gag is telling a version of a joke that's not as wacky as it used to be, there's still a lot to recommend on its own. For one thing, even if it's mainly riffing on the tone and texture of juvenile adventure fiction, it's still approaching it from the same kind of adult reinterpretation of the same that informed Ghostbusters the same year. Yes, we get our action and shootouts and big spaceship battle finale, but the spectacle is strictly punctuation in a film that's much more interested in imagining what these kind of characters might think, feel, and talk to each other about once you're old enough to consider that they do so at all. A lot of the big joke is carried off through deadpan exposition, so a lot of the movie is just weaving the gonzo details of the imaginary universe and phony bonsai deep lore into rambling conversational dialogue. Billy? Tell Sam to prep the jet car for city driving. What about a blue blaze strike team? No, we keep it intimate. Call the Kalani brothers, call the Rucksuckers. Where are you going? Get my gun. Well, something has reared its ugly head in outer space, Mr. President, and it looks like the Earth has caught a crossfire. But we have reason to believe that there are vicious red aliens walking freely among us, posing as the owners and operators of Yo-Yo Dine propulsion systems. Uh, Yo-Yo Dine propulsion, uh... The people working on our transient bomber? In the hands of foreign nationals, Excuse me, you Mr. Say? President. Time is short. In order to prevent John Warfin's escape, my comrades are at this very moment taking up a geostationary position over New Jersey. This situation is explosive. You know your two strike groups. Apache group, that's you, Reno. Chaparral group, that's you, Perfect Tommy. John Parker, you'll ride with Chaparral. That's my guess that no human being has ever been inside the place. So who knows what we're gonna find there. Wow. Declaration of War, the short form. It also has a hell of a supporting cast. Clancy Brown, Pepe Serna, Lewis Smith, Robert Ito, Christopher Lloyd, Dan Hedaya, Ronald Lacey, Rosalind Cash, Yakov Shmirnov is even in there, along with Goldblum, Barkin, and Lithgow as already noted. And on most of the DVDs, you can even see deleted scenes with Jamie Lee Curtis and James Saito as Buckaroo's parents. Uh, James Saito, for the record, has been in like a thousand things, but my generation probably still recognizes him best as the Shredder. Speaking of which, no, Peter Weller does not even look a little bit like a biracial man. Other than Buckaroo's shoe-polished black hair and the occasional flourish of Japanese dialogue, there's not much attention actually made at doing anything with that particular aspect of the character, which does date the film a bit by highlighting the whole thread as little more than an extra drop of exoticism playing on the outsized early 80s paranoia about the rising technological and economic power of Japan, though your mileage will vary as to whether this is problematic or merely just weird. There's all the left. Pink dress. On the same note, Ellen Barkin's turn as Penny Pretty is probably the most interesting but somewhat uncomfortable extreme of the boys' adventure fiction for grown-up stylistic conceit, playing a version of the damsel beauty caught up in the chaos archetype as a realistically jaded and fairly damaged human being, but never really subverting it to the degree you might hope she would. One of the recurring mythology gags, meanwhile, is that the occasionally mentioned lone female member of the Hong Kong Cavaliers is busy with another mission and does not appear in the film. Who were you really trying to annihilate last night? You. Just like the papers all say. Then you leave me in the lurch while you strap on your six guns? What do you want from me, Buckaroo? Who am I? As near as I can figure, you had an identical twin sister, and I married her. That's over now. She's gone, and that's about all there is really to say about that. But John Warfin said we could kill her. Hey, I don't give a flying handshake what your name is. I'm here to see a bomber. Sure, Let's just go back upstairs to my office. Talk about this like two reasonable beings. Now you listen to me. Your private life, that's your own concern, but I'm here to see a bomber, and I'm damn sure I'm gonna see it now. Leave her to me. You take care of business. Thanks.
When it comes to it, my favorite thing about the whole endeavor is all the odd things that are just allowed to sit without any real explanation, like how the Red Electroids are such lazy, inept bad guys, what with their misspelled signs, terrible cover stories, and evil operations thrown together out of duct tape and chewing gum, all of which goes great with Lithgow's magnificent caricature of a dictator buying into his own delusion. What is the greatest the joy? The joy of beauty! Louder! The joy of beauty! History is made at night. Character is what you are in the dark. We must work while the clock she's ticking. We hide, they seek. Step to the back of the clock. Where are we going? Let it in. Amazingly, a film this bizarre and specific in its humor was not a success in its day and did not catch on at all. The studio was completely baffled as to what the filmmakers had delivered and made basically zero effort to promote it outside of Star Trek conventions and ads and comic books, ultimately dropping it into less than 250 screens in mid-August during a summer season where Temple of Doom, Star Trek III, and Ghostbusters were all still dominating the conversation, barely clearing $6 million of its reported $17 million budget. There's a persistent urban legend that the half-jokingly promised sequel Buckaroo Banzai Against the World Crime League eventually morphed into director W. D. Richter's screenplay for John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China, owing to the similarities in tone, and that film's David Lopin being a send-up of the oriental supervillain tropes meant to be invoked by Buckaroo's unmentioned on-screen arch-nemesis Hanoi Jan, but Richter was actually rewriting an earlier, pre-existing western set treatment for Big Trouble, not his own material. However, actor Dennis Dunn does claim to have disobeyed the advice of his agent not to sign on for the film specifically because he was a big fan of Buckaroo Banzai, which did ultimately find other loyal but dedicated fans thanks to cable and home video viewings and the cult popularity of the heavily annotated in on the joke novelization that treated the film as a condensed docudrama of actual events. There have been attempts to launch a regular series of novels, comics, spin-offs, and TV shows many times since, but none with much success. The film, at least, is finally relatively easy to acquire on well-produced Blu-ray thanks to Shout Factory, and unless you've been staring at the screen for the past however many minutes, jaws agape, wondering how anyone could possibly enjoy this thing, Touch it. Might be a bomb, man. Ah, it's a toy. Get away from that bar! I'll drink your blood! What you got there, son? That's not real, is it? It's definitely worth your attention. The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension is a one-of-a-kind gem. Remember, no matter where you go, there you are. Hey gang, here's a question that keeps coming up. If your handle is Movie Bob, where are your movie reviews? Well, my old reviews are in a lot of places. You'll find many of them on my YouTube channel, but you'll find the brand new ones on Geek.com, an awesome site that's also your one-stop news source for science, TV, gaming, technology, nerd culture, the works. You can find all my reviews directly by going to Geek.com slash author slash B. Chipman, because that's my real name, and you can get regular updates on all my reviews and all of Geek.com's other great content by signing up for their kick-ass newsletter at subscribe.geek.com. And don't forget to also subscribe to the Geek.com YouTube channel, where you'll find the videos that accompany my reviews and tons of other great content, too. Remember, that's Geek.com, the Geek.com newsletter, and Geek.com on YouTube. Make sure you don't miss out on all the latest Movie Bob reviews. You can also check out my own new website, Movie Bob Central, where you'll find my blog, links to all my work, and shop for my books, ebooks, and future Movie Bob products. And please remember to like these videos, share them with all of your friends, and subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching another Movie Bob production.